Hello everyone. Last time we covered the story of Kazan, where we failed in taking over as Trey Prince, and we ended up handing over all of our moolah to Trey Prince Gallywigs. He only laughed as he changed our deal, enslaved us all as we left the island and the eruption from Mount Kajaro. <laughs> We were supposed to have these stupid slaves to Kalimdor days ago. I'm not taking the fall for this one. You're the one who got us lost. What does it matter? Gallywix is gonna have both our heads. Shh. Did you hear that? Captain, who are they? It doesn't matter. Our orders are to capture the Horde target at all costs. No witnesses. Our journey was supposed to take us to Kalimdor, to Azara, but instead we end up in the middle of an alliance horde battle. No witnesses, as Gallywix's vessel is blown up. Now we're shipwrecked, marooned and near death. Doc Zepnussel is able to zap some life back into us, but in the end, it's going to be our choice. Are we going to come back to life and be the hero that our fellow survivors need us to be, or are we going to rest for eternity here? Only we can decide, and our story has just begun, so we stay away from the lights and we get back to work. With a pair of thermohydratic flippers from Gizmo, we save our friends still trapped in their escape pods, yet the very first one that we open up, that one might have been better to be left alone. Hello there! So nice of you to rescue me. No hard feelings, right? Sadly, the Trey Prince also survived, but eh. Uh, what can you do? On the Lost Isles at Shipwreck Shore, we meet up with our former executive assistant Sassy Hart Ranch, who lets us know that the local monkeys, they're quite the problem. They've stolen our bombs and tools. Without them, we have absolutely no way to get off this island, so we'll have to get them back. The monkeys don't just leave the bombs alone either, they're actually throwing them at us. Now Fizz Lighter, he's taken some of his nitro and he's put them in the bananas. These nitro potassium bananas, they're irresistible to the bomb throwing monkeys and it's an absolute joy to see them fly. Our stuff is not the only thing they've been stealing. They've also taken the eggs away of the Terraptor Matriarch, who've now been starting to hatch. We've got hungry Terraptor hatchlings running around all over the place, looking to make a quick meal out of us. We didn't start this, but it is our problem, so we have to kill the young. Never fear! Trade Prince Gallywix is here. We'll be on our way to our new home in Azara before you know it. Despite the bumbling interference of you know who. The Trey Prince has not forgotten how much he despises us, rescue or not. He'll get his revenge soon enough, mark his words. We'll fare far worse than being his slave. But those are words for another day. Let's make sure that the island doesn't get to us first. With the tools returned, we can start working on a way to get off this island. And as luck would have it, Foreman Dampwick, he's uncovered a cave full of Kajamite on this very island. The only problem is that the monkeys, they felt the effect of Kajamite, similar to how it helped the goblins. On that note, by the way, something that I didn't explain properly in the Kazan video, is that the original goblins, they actually lost a fair bit of the effects of Kajamite after they were created by Keeper Mimiron. This is what then in turn allowed the trolls to enslave them, and their reintroduction with the Kajamites, 
That is what reinvigorated their intelligence and then allowed for their rebellion. It also explains why they get so very excited about Kajamite, why it's so ingrained in their society, even their drinks contain it, and it makes you wonder what exactly would happen if they ever ran out. Just wanted to clarify that point. Now here we see that the monkeys, they've also gotten a boost in intelligence, they're minded a Kajamite for themselves, and they do not appreciate the goblins trying to take what is theirs. We'll have to escort our very lost miner to get to the good stuff. Now while we're in the cave, we also check out some of the cave paintings and the pygmy altar. On top of it is the corpse of an orc who carries an interesting journal detailing what exactly happened to them. It's a good thing that we studied orcish, as it mentions how the orc got on a ship called Dracas Fury and they were taking a special cargo to a faraway place across the ocean. On day 3, the sea lashes the ship very heavily and the captain orders them to take down their sails. On day 4, they spot two small islands on the horizon. I assume that those are Kazan and the Lost Isles. The captain says that they're just going to sail past them. He does not want to stop. There's an edge to his voice that the orc does not like. It sounds to him like fear. And soon enough, there are sounds of explosions outside. The battle that we accidentally joined. The battle started by the allies who came at them, hiding behind the larger of the two islands. The orc reports that they've made a makeshift camp atop the island. Agra has asked him to look for other survivors on the western shore. He decided to check out this cavern, and that investigation, that proved to be deadly. With the pygmy witch doctor dead, we can lay claim to the mine. By goblin law, all Kajamite belongs to us. Sazzy examines the pictures that we've taken, and she's not really liking what we have to say. It sounds like they're paintings of us and the pygmies, some new race that they've never seen before, on an island with an exploding volcano. Two volcanoes in a single week. Luck is not exactly on our side, but perhaps this journal that will give us the opening that we need to sit down with the orcs and make some new friends. Hopefully, they're not going to kill us on sight as we go out to meet with Agra, the mate of Thrall. She and the orcs in the area, like those that we see kicking the crap out of an SI7 agent, they're all that remains of the crew of Draka's Fury. Since we have a common enemy in the alliance, perhaps we can actually work together. Killer Gorfang and a few of their scouts, they've traveled into the Vale to search for that precious cargo that they were guarding when the filthy alliance sunk their ship. The only problem is that the path is blocked by deadly plants. It's time for a bit of goblin ingenuity as we whip out our goblin all in wonder belt and use our weed whacker to clear the way. At the wild overlook, our gadgets come in handy once again as this area is overrun by SI7 assassins and the orcs, they're having a very hard time spotting them. Not to worry though, our infrared heat focals, they're just what we need as they reveal the death waiting in the shadows. We take care of them and then go onwards on the back of Bastia to the cliffs overlooking the Alliance beachheads. The cargo, that's so precious to the horde, that's being held on one of their ships. We need to get to the chopper! and fly to their flagship, which is called the Vengeance Wake, we need to clear it out and then retrieve the cargo. Turns out that this cargo is actually former Warchief Thrall, being held captive with magic that's preventing him from connecting to the elements. With the Alliance Wizard dead, that's no longer the case, and Thrall unleashes the fury of the elements upon the enemy. I will see you up top. Thank you again for my freedom. Speed of the storm! Heed my call! Spirits of the sea, rise and lay waste to my enemies! With the Alliance sailors properly taken care of, we return to the Wild Overlook, where everyone's already gathered. The plan is to travel to the larger portion of the Lost Isles, but we can't exactly swim there, since there are a whole bunch of sharks in the waters, so Foreman Dampwick, he's built his rocket sling to shoot us over. You think you're such a big shot, saving everyone and making friends with these orc savages. I'm gonna crush you. I'm the trade prince, me! I got a plan that's gonna get me off this island and make me the king of Ajara. Mark my words, I'm gonna get you. I'll get you all out of my way! Well, if Gallywix isn't afraid of the ride, then neither are we. They've been able to salvage a town in a box, but someone was able to steal the dock and the oil refinery. Now who exactly would do that, and where did Galloway's go to? Questions for later, as our first priority, that is getting our people some food. Harbert Grapplehammer has us tie some remote controlled fireworks to the wild cluckers, which sends them flying back home, and it gives us a nice supply of the clucker eggs. Bam Megabomb, he thinks that they're way too tiny, so he has us use those eggs as bait to lure in the spiny raptors and steal the larger eggs. Not wanted to be outdone, Grapplehammer has us go for the biggest egg of all, the one that comes from a micro mecha chicken. 
every tile in a box is equipped with one of those, and since the circuit boards are fried, it's not exactly micro any longer. All the same, the biggest egg is recovered. McNuggets for everybody! Except the egg has gone bad. It's very explosive and also pretty foul smelling. Let's step away from the egg plan and put some meat on the menu. Shark meat to be precise, but we wouldn't be goblins if we just go out with our fishing rods. No, 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 no. We've got much bigger plans. By collecting shark parts and combining them with the robotic remains of the mecha chicken, we actually create a rocket-fueled shark, the ultimate seafaring killing machine. Its power is so great that it's even able to take on the mightiest shark in the water, aptly called the hammer, and with its death, we'll be able to exploit the natural resources to their fullest extent. Our work here is done for now, but there's no rest for the wicked. Max Dreadshatter believes that the Naga at the ruins of Vash Alan, they're preparing to invade our town in a box. As proof, she has a whole bunch of dead scouts, and she's not about to let them try. We're gonna get a jump on them instead, by replacing the banners with her own, also skinning them for the pristine heights that make a fair bit of moolah. Finally, we also steal their children by luring them away with our irresistible pool pony. Everybody loves a pool pony, it's their fastest selling toy behind the Kablooey Bombs Infant Edition. And while she would love to turn the Naga's children into plush toys and sell them, we're going to use them as a bargaining chip. There's no way that the Naga will attack us as long as we hold the children hostage. A clear path into the heart of the ruins, where we're going to convince their leader to surrender. Unfortunately, and we probably should have seen this coming with all the tentacles in the area, the Naga are not led by another Naga. Instead, they're led by a faceless of the deep. It remembers when our race was created, and it fears not for the sake of the children. He's ready to erase us, but underestimates this little goblin's might. For money and beachfront property! In the end, it turns out that we were wrong though. It wasn't even the Naga that were preparing to attack us. It was the nearby Pikmi Umlaut tribe, and they're marching for war. Under the cover of a helmet that we were able to buy from the Pikmis. A helmet that used to belong to some great leader of theirs called Dark Tan Helmet. We're able to slip by their troops and get back to town. The PC Eliminators, they've already been deployed. With it, we're able to cut their numbers down quite a bit, but they already took a bunch of our townsfolk captive. We need to send a message to these little guys, a message in blood, by taking out the leader, Ingui, at Umlaut village, while also saving a couple of the captured goblins. As we do, the captives let us know that they took the others up into the volcano, where some of them are turned into zombies, while others are sacrificed to their god, Volcano. The zombies are coming. Zombified goblins, the town must be warned, but they're already up to speed as an army of the very slow zombies, they're crawling their way towards the town. We easily avoid them as we move up to the last peak, where the coach is very happy to see the star player again, and he's ready to get into the game. With our super booster rocket boots, we fly through the village, easily taking care of the zombies, those that we once called friends and family. We take care of the army, which, which is great and all, but we won't stop the pygmies unless we take out the source, the witch doctors called Gal, Malmo, and Telok. While we're cruising around, we also make sure to pick up the source of the rocking powers. Rocking powder. It turns out that this stuff, which turns them into world-class rockers, is also highly explosive, and we're going to need it for what is coming next. You might wonder, what exactly is the story behind the Pygmies, but not a lot is actually known. World of Warcraft the Magazine Issue 5, the same magazine that informed us first about the Dark Troll origin for the Night Elves, that one suggests that there's a common ancestor to be found for both the Goblins and the Pygmies. Now from the Chronicles, which was released after this magazine, we learned that it was Keeper Mimiron that used the Kashemite to experiment on various races, which then greatly enhanced their intellects. Some of these test subjects, they were members of a small primitive race that roamed the forest near Ulduar, and they would become known as the Goblins. Now the sky is the limit, until Blizzard actually gives a clear ruling. Pygmies, they could be another experiment by Mimiron, they could be the result of Goblins losing their intelligence for the first time, or perhaps they found their own path to Kashemite, and they have an evolutionary path of their own. That is uncertain, but we can say that there are some elements to music for the race. As I mentioned, we pick up the powder, that's their source of their rocking powers, while well, the leaders, Ingui, Gao, and Telok, their references to musical artists. Even their casting animation would not look out of place at a concert. Now going back to our questing experience, with the zombie army and the leaders taken care of, the town in the box should be safe, and with the powder, we get a boost to the caldera, which is the lair of their turtle god. Fun fact, in early development, they actually planned to have a Kong kind of character here. 
Now Hobbert, he uses a couple of the fire glands taken from Volcano's children to modify her boots into the one and only Butsuka. He's fairly certain that he perfectly calibrated the targeting, but in practice, as we fight this turtle god and his fiery breath, the rockets go all over the place. Enough of them do hit our target to get rid of it, but our explosions, they, you know, kinda accidentally make the volcano go a little bit crazy and again we deal with a volcano erupting. Sazzy gets us the hell out of there as everything burns. The trees, the ground, the sky, our little town in a box. Everything's on fire and we should get off this island as soon as possible. Before we do that though, we still have some business to take care of as we reunite with Fro and the Hordes who are once again dealing with the alliance that have not quite yet learned their lesson. The war chief has promised to help us rescue our people and deal with Gallywigs we help them with the alliance. Their ships might have been destroyed, but they still have planes that are dropping troops onto the coast below. Our forces are doing their best to hold the line, but they could definitely use a hand with clearing their numbers. Meanwhile, Agra wants revenge for the orcs that were murdered in cold blood. We did nothing to provoke them, so heads will roll. Specifically, the heads of Alexi Silent Howl, Darkblade Sin and Commander Aragon, all members of the SI7. While on the beach, we also make sure to detonate the landmines that they planted, from a safe distance of course, and then it's off into the sky, flying the pride of Kazan. Those Nomadagon stealth fighters, they don't stand a chance, and true to his word, Thrall's ready to get us going in the right direction to rescue our people. It's Gallywigs who once again enslaved them, now forcing them to mine Kashemites, and our friends, they're so intimidated that all they can do is really drool and look at us. This calls for the new and improved Kasha Cola 01. Half of the calories, double the ideas than any old regular Kasha Cola. This little brew, it gives our friends the kick that they need to snap out of it. But the nightmare will never be over while Blast Shadow the Broodmaster still breathes. Time to change that. And since he's a warlock with a succubus named Delicia Whipsnaps at his side, we make sure to kill the demon first, him second. And just for good measure, we also make sure to destroy his soul stone so that he can't come back. One of the minecarts, it offers us a quick ride down the side of the volcano, where our friends were kind enough to pile on a whole bunch of bombs, just to make sure that our descent was a nice and soft one. Here it is, where we discover what happened to the missing dock and the oil refinery from the town in a box. Gallywix has used them to set up operations here, so let's make sure to cause as much destruction as we can. First up is the oil rig, which we set to blow, and we even get some sweet, sweet revenge on Chippendale, the scumbag that stole a girlfriend and is now working for the wrong team. Speaking of girlfriends, at the slave pits, our old sweetheart Candy, she's now working for the Trey Prince. If you liked it, you should have put a larger, more elaborate ring on it. She dropped us like a bad habit, and now she's working for the other team. But it even gets worse. Since we dealt with Chip, she's now dating the Trey Prince. Now I don't know about you, but if she were my ex, I'd rip her fickle heart right out of her chest. And that's exactly what we do. Goblins, man. They're hardcore. Don't break their hearts, that's for sure. Now we also sent our imprisoned fellow goblins flying off into space. The original plan was to just shoot the cages with some rocket firepower, but we kind of forgot that the cages come with a bottom. Ah well, what comes up must eventually come down. The time for our final showdown is finally here. They worked very hard and improving the foot bomb uniform. With parts that we collected from the Steam Weedle Sharks, they turned it into the ultimate foot bomb uniform. Just the outfit that we're going to need to take on the Trey Prince. Now I don't know what he made his vehicle out of, but I feel like we're missing an opportunity to supply all of the horde with it. Since the goblin, he's actually able to hold his own against Thrall. I like you! Here's a raise! I see the traitor is here to rescue you, Watchy. How convenient. You will both bow to me or fall together. Here's some of that moolah back that I took from you. <laughs> uncle, uncle, I give. You guys are too much for me. I'm beaten. You've shown me the error of my ways. From here on out, I promise to reform the way the cartel is run. I'm your goblin, Thrall. What would you have of me? Together, we're able to kick Gallywix's butt, and now we can properly deal with him. And when I say deal with him, I mean keep him on as the leader of the goblins. You know, what, what did he really do? Enslave his people? Twice? Try to kill Thrall? You know, no biggie. Let's just make him the faction leader. Kidding aside though, he definitely embodies what it means to be a goblin. So he stays on as a leader while we finally set sail once again. 
Nice touch to actually see those Liberator Goblins flow down in a block of ice. And our good friend Thrall, he's kind enough to give us a package for his Darkspear friend on the dock at Bladefish Bay. She's going to help us get into Orgrimmar safely, while Thrall, Agra and the rest of them, they will continue their journey as well. These days, you hand over the package to Saurfang, a package which contains an SI7 emblem, an emblem with blood on the patch that was torn off from an SI7 officer's uniform. In the past, you actually turn it in at Garrosh Hellscream, and turning it in has the war chief take a step back, visibly shaken. I understand the meaning of this all too well, he said, and then quickly had the goblins of the Bilgewater cartel now serve the hordes. There was actually quite a bit of speculation back in the day based on this quest, with people wondering why the war chief was so shaken. Was it because he realized there were spies amongst the hordes, or was there more at play? Was it actually Thrall sending a message to let him know that his plans had failed? How did the Alliance know about Thrall's travels? Exactly where to wait for the ambush? Was that the reason why their captain was feeling fear? Did he know what was coming? Was he in on it? And why was there such a massive SI7 operation never to be mentioned again? What was the motivation to capture Thrall in the first place? Perhaps it's linked to the events in the novel The Shattering? There's a lot of room for answers and clarification, but... I guess at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter much. Since the events, and some would say massive events, going after the former Warchief of the Horde, the future ally against Deathwing, you'd imagine that would have some ramifications or consequences for the Alliance. But no, nothing at all. I don't actually recall it being mentioned ever again. So maybe one day they'll decide to give more explanation, or actually have it play a part in the story. For now though, ladies and gentlemen, that is the story of the Lost Isles. And once again, I'll leave it up to you guys and girls to decide what zone we'll cover next. Leave your suggestions in the comments down below subscribe if you like my videos and until next time guys see ya